walk you how to become a confident car buyer. If your screen is not loading, please refresh your screen. Please make sure your view is in participant mode. I'm Danielle Cook Ferguson, Senior Marketing Specialist at Congressional Federal Credit Union and moderator for today's presentation. Congressional Federal provides innovative and affordable financial products and services, education, and community outreach to the Congressional FCU family, which includes the House of Representatives, Congressional Support Offices, and functions on Capitol Hill, in addition to affinity and non-affinity select employment groups. Established on July 9, 1953 by eight congressional employees with just $40 in deposits, we have gone to over 47,000 members and still counting. Confederal has developed a reputation as a trusted credit union based on its proven track record of reliability with its members. Our presentation today will run about an hour, including time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A pod uh, to the right of your main screen. I will be collecting them during the Q&A portion of the presentation. This presentation is being recorded and an archive link will be emailed to you within the next couple of days. Today's center is Paul Schmidt. Paul is the Auto Loans and Insurance Manager at Congressional Federal Credit Union and an expert in all aspects of car buying. He has over 20 years of experience serving the credit union community and has been directly involved in the auto dealership, credit union, and insurance arenas in a variety of capacities. And now I will turn the presentation over to Paul. Thank you, Good morning, everyone. The question, what is a confident car buyer, is a wonderful discussion topic because most people go in with, with a amount of information ready to buy a car, but the one ingredient, perhaps maybe you use the word resolve, to be able to follow through and get what you're looking for with the right set of circumstances. That is, the month payment you're looking for, uh, changing the features and options on the car you're looking for, and getting the terms you're looking for. So the car buyer is exactly how we want to go into the dealer to make that purchase. Uh, it's also important to note that when you go in confidently to anything, people pursue in a particular way, and it just makes your job easier. Who or what is a confident car buyer? Actually, it breaks down into four components. One, someone who goes in or is a lot of good information to use. You've got that represents the things that are important to you, the better you are. If else has information and you do not, it's a disparity there. There's a lack of leverage or balance. You need to be able to go in knowing what you want, and they need to provide you the information that will solve the issues or the desires you have. The second part of being a confident car buyer is someone that's willing to walk away. The ability to walk away, and I do mean ability is that ability to be able to say to someone, if I don't hear what I'm looking to hear, reasonable set of circumstances, I'm going to go someplace else until I find it. Too often we find ourselves in a position where we will allow someone else to talk and talk until we get what we're looking for. Sometimes it's better to just cut bait someplace else and find someone who's going to treat you with the respect and provide you with the results you're looking for. So information is very, very valuable and you need to be able to walk away. For that, and somebody needs to listen to you. So the car buyer, car buyer is someone that's going to approach someone that will listen to what they want to need. That means you need to know what you want to need and be able to communicate that. But you're part of the equation. You need someone who is going to be at least willing to listen to what they think they can accomplish for you. And if that means Giving test drive in a vehicle longer than they expect, that's part of it. If it's listening to the answer the first time and not trying to give you, get you to get you different answers, that might be part of it as well. But that ability to listen is very key to making sure that that confident car buyer is respected. And the final one is, is options. A confident car buyer is not somebody who goes in waiting for somebody to tell them the first of much information that they need to get for the buy. What is the internet, the 
discussions they may have with friends and family, all the information it takes to learn about a particular vehicle, find the vehicle, that gives you options. That includes financing, whether that financing is for a longer period of time, for a small amount, but by the monthly budget you've got and the payment you desire, those options are key to what you're looking for. How do you get those options? Well, that's what we're going to talk about now. You go to the next slide. Looks like you're different. Stand by. Hello, that we have experts. Thank you very much. Decide to buy a car. There are several key questions that anyone should ask when they're buying a car. What our questions are, and they're most important to you, they are absolutely about you, and they're only about you. The dealer can provide you answers. But if you have a question, and the question needs to be answered, don't let it go. Too many people buy too many cars without having all the right input, and or the one that can determine those. Some of the questions might be, why are you buying the car, and how will you use the vehicle? It could be because you're a part of a family and you need you to take uh, kids around or go to work and, uh, with a, uh, a commute. The economy might be very important to you, so gas mileage is right up at the top of your list. It could be where you're going is rough terrain. You need four-wheel drive. You need that special uh, designed vehicle to handle almost anything that would be in front of you. Those things you need to determine ahead of time and do the research to gather the right vehicle or select it down to the proper set of feature and options that will work for you. When you determine what those are, then the questions you present to the dealer about the vehicles you select. Another part of this equation it has to do with payments. Payments are very important. Payments are as important to you as buying a car. When you get to the end of the day, look for everything that's appropriate to the car, have left over is your money payments. Payments are what you remember far, far down the road when you have gotten how much you paid for the vehicle. Payment is also the obligation you must maintain so that the next car you buy is one you choose because you built up good credit and you've developed a very solid footing to make future purchases. What we're through now are some very common first-time buyer mistakes that people make. It's only because you haven't been through this process before, but that we're here for is to help you that, that road. Some of the mistakes include not arranging your financing ahead of time. In many cases, it's quite easy. It's a matter of filling out an application and out what your credit will allow you to purchase in terms of interest rate and the amount of money that you can borrow also gets down to what your payments are. Your are very important because at the end of the month, it really is, do you have the money to make that payment and do you have all the other funds it takes to maintain the responsibilities that are associated with the car? That could include your gas money, it could include parking fees, it could be paying the insurance, and depending upon what type of vehicle you get and how old it might be, so the upkeep that will absolutely come because you are owning an older car. Don't underestimate all the extra fees. When you're setting up your budget, make sure that you've incorporated all the things that you wouldn't normally think about in that budget. At the end of the month, it's not a hard thing to do at all. You just write check, you make payment, and you enjoy your vehicle. You can do that is by not overestimating your buying power. We go online and see that beautiful vehicle that that we're looking for and the color we've always wanted with that leather or the sunroof and the fine stereo and many of the safety features that most of us want nowadays. We bet not looking at the price of the vehicle. Well, when you buy a vehicle and you land on the car you want, if you don't have the ability to pay for that vehicle, it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody won't lend you the money. 
It could be that they will lend you the money, but it'll cost you. The best to do is to make sure that you have evaluated all your options, as we said before, ahead of time. When you do that, you're not overbuying. So have a budget of $300 a month. That budget should fit in with the interest rate and the length of time you're looking for to determine exactly how much you're going to buy. You add to the money that you might put down in the car, and now you're a confident buyer. If you know you have $18,000, why look at a car that's $25,000? Confident, know your information. Part of so is getting the additional research that you need to find, and there's lots of resources. End of this webinar will provide you just a few resources that you can use to do that research, or at least get headed in the right direction. Some of that search might include how well does this vehicle perform? Is the gas mileage? What's the error record on the vehicle? Doing that research ahead of time is valuable. Not only tell you what you want to find, but it'll also steer you away from some of those traps that others might find themselves in. The key problem to this is an age-old problem. We have lots of television shows and movies that talk about a very young buyer looking for a vehicle and fall in love with that gorgeous Camaro or that wonderful Mustang. They become absolutely giddy with delight for the, the possible car that they might be buying. Well, the older person there, maybe a parent, that is not so quick to not indicate to somebody that we're willing to pay anything for the car. That's being Uyghur. And being Uyghur isn't just for that Mustang or the Camaro. It could be thinking you've got the right deal or you found the perfect car. And by the mean the price is right and the payment fits the way you want, we feel eager there, too. We need to indicate that we have an interest. We need to ensure that we're in control, more confident, but we're not going to jump at every opportunity. Remember, every great opportunity is right for you. you see before you, you can start at any point along the way. The circles that are there are all key components to what you're about to do. Whether with considering all your monthly expenses, you're going to have to consider it at some point or another. If you're quite sure where that is and you want to get started someplace, think the monthly budget might be for a car payment that you might think is acceptable. Say if it's $250 per month. For $50 per month, take a look, see what your net pay is. That when you get your monthly pay or your weekly or bi weekly pay, what is the exact amount of the check that you can put into the bank? Your net. The projected monthly payment for your car from that, what you have left over is what you're going to use to pay all your other bills. That's why it's critical that you account for all the costs and expenses that you have related or unrelated to the car. But you want to get all those costs associated with the car out on the table. And that includes the gas, parking, insurance, and all kinds of other upkeep that might be associated with the vehicle. All things will then have to be accounted for when you look at the end of the purchase and you're looking to pay for your tax and tag fees. Tax tag fees can range from anywhere from four to six, seven, and depending on the weight in the vehicle in the jurisdiction, 8% of the value of the vehicle at the time of sale. You add two to three hundred dollars worth of tag fees, and you can see where it can all add up very, very, very quickly. That comes out of what you can afford. $20,000, and that's all you've got. A $20,000 purchase, without taking into consideration your tax and tax, is going to make this process difficult. However, if you know you have an $18,000 vehicle, and you know you have tax and tax to put into this process, things will turn out much better. Know everything up front. You can determine what your down payment is, and you can determine that. It isn't necessarily a part of the financing. Some funding will require, based on their kinds, 5, 10, 15 percent, what interest percent that they determine is critical or essential for the deal. However, if you've got good credit and you take your time and you do your finance research ahead of time, that payment is important, but it may not necessarily represent a percentage or something you have to come up with. The most of the vehicle, the down payment will be expected. 
So down payments are important, not the only thing you need to consider. Buy for your loan. It's rather simple, but without buying for that loan, you won't know all the other critical factors you need to know. Once you apply for your loan, then everything else you see in all those circles that we can see around uh, your screen there will make much more sense to you. Now you know what your interest rate is. You'll know you can finance for three or four or perhaps even five years. In some cases, the terms are available, but they will also cost you as well. You need to make sure you take those into consideration. Alternative financing, like balloons, will provide you the ability to get a little more car, maybe with a little less money down, with more options in the future. It's not for everyone, but it's perfect for some. By that, I mean the dealer. What do you do? Well, when you're talking to the dealer, remember, they work for the dealer. Those are bad people. It doesn't mean they won't try and help you where they can. The person who represents your interests the most are you. You have to take the responsibility and be confident in representing your point of view. The dealer has asked questions, questions that you will pose to be able to get this deal concluded. If the answers aren't right, it's your responsibility, as we talked about, to walk away. But things we can do to help ourselves is not provide ammunition, if you will, when you start this deal. If you trade a car loan with or with a balance that's still owed on the vehicle, it probably makes sense to leave that car at home. If a friend, have them drive you, or have someone just simply drop you off. If they do, if there's a car to trade, say, we don't have to worry about that, I'm here to buy a car. The reason I want to do that is because they hold back, by I mean the dealer, some of the opportunity for savings that you are entitled to or could have because they think you might want more money for a trade. If you have a trade and the car's worth 7000 and the 8000 is important to you, they have that much room in the deal, that's something that they can keep in their pocket until the time comes to talk about the trade. If they don't know what trade's there, then they put their best foot forward more soon in a quicker way. That's something you need to know. Once that part, part of the deal done, the, the car, then you proceed and discuss everything else, you being part of it. I research before you go in as well, and it includes the trade too. There's lots of resources out there. DA, uh, there's uh, uh, evaluation systems. People will come out and look at your vehicle. Blue book, black book. All these are opportunities for you to get a good idea of what your car's worth. The detail, the trade-in value, there's own value. Get a consensus of what might be there. You might want to look out there to see if there's some sort of advertisement on a vehicle very similar to the car you've got. That tells you a lot when you get into that part of the negotiation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Prior to walk away. Whether it's front part where you're dealing with just the car you're looking to buy or the trade when they're telling you things you don't want to hear. One giving you the information and it seems like you're far apart. Why you stay if it's like they're not going to budge? Get up and go away. If they want to talk to you more and they're going to give you different information, that may be the only way that they're going to continue that discussion and give the information you're looking for. Be prepared. You don't have to walk away, but that the know that you will is definitely going to work in your favor. We talked about a little bit already, but what's most important is what's comfortable for you. If you can afford a payment and you have a certain down payment, they invest you with a little more money down, you lose your payments, or in fact get close to that initial payment you're looking for. That's all in good. But chances are you worked hard to get the money for the down payment you've got. Coming up with a down payment that's more than the one that you've brought is probably just as difficult at the end of the month of trying to make a $300 payment 
when you were budgeting for 225. To your guns, you know you better than they do. Remember over purchase. Don't get into a vehicle whose price is much more than you can really afford. That will help you. It will keep your confidence up and it will put you in the control you both need and desire. Warranties and incentives on a vehicle are very, very big points nowadays. We've had 0% and low rate financing for quite a time now. We also have there are enormous rebates. Highest rebates out there in 10 to 15, maybe 20 years, we're being told. If you have a high rebate of two to $3,000 and you're weighing this against 0%, I ask you to consider one thing. If you have 20 payments into a 60 month note with 0% and you pay that vehicle off, benefit goes away. However, if you're rebate and it's $1,000 and you collect that upfront to reduce the cost of the vehicle, when you pay that financing off early or go to end, it doesn't make a difference. Your cost for the sales of that vehicle will never go away. Earn that money, it's in pocket, and no one can take it. It does hold true that way depending upon the amount of the rebate and the amount of incentive uh, interest rate. But that's what your financial institution can help you look at. They can help you review those, and there's lots of locators or, or uh, calculators on the internet that will help you determine these for yourself. Plug in no, plug in a rebate, take out the rebate, and put that special financing in. You're going to be able to see the difference in the payment and how much money you'll pay overall. Thumb line, your total payments and your down payment all put together determine your overall cost of the vehicle. These are critical factors and things you need to consider. I talked about new cars versus used cars. And it seems like it's a fairly simple discussion. And in fact, it's quite clear that there are definite benefits and there are definite disadvantages. However, there may be some that you haven't considered. Those that when you get a new car, you can pretty much get the vehicle you're looking for if you're patient. If the car that you want is not on the lot, the dealer can often get that vehicle from another vehicle, or perhaps with a little bit of patience, it can be brought in after several weeks or a month. It's also good to know that that vehicle has a particular value. That is clear. The MP, or the sticker price of the vehicle, should be exactly the same for every vehicle that might differ maybe by the vehicle ID number. But if all features and options are the same, and the color is the same, no matter where you go, the sticker should be the same. That gives you an ability to be able to determine mostly whether the deal is a good deal or a bad deal comparatively to other deals that might be out there. Warranties will also be benefits. Most vehicles have two types of vehicle warranties. That is the bumper bumper that covers virtually everything on the vehicle, except for maybe limited warranties on tires and batteries, all the way to the other part, which is your extended powertrain warranty. That would include the engine and transmission. They'll be a little longer where they're different, and they're not to be confused with a bumper to bumper. On a used car, we'll talk about what an extended warranty may or may not represent. The advantage very often can also be disadvantages not too far down the road. When you buy a new car, the next day or a month later, or even consider trading that vehicle in. Don't think you're going to get close to the same price of the vehicle. You'll realize that how many thousands of dollars may not be there when you try to trade that same vehicle. It doesn't mean it's a bad purchase, but you need to go into this well aware that the car provides wonderful benefits. And one of the benefits may not include a price that you can get with this car. And let someone else pay that depreciation. Let's are also higher at that point. When you get a car, obviously the higher price will then a higher loan depending upon the value of the vehicle and the payment that you'll provide. So be careful. There are pluses and minuses and balance them out according to what's most important to you. You first present options and other that are quite distinct available to you that are not available on the new car. For example, when you buy that one or two year old vehicle, you'll notice the savings, as we said before, significantly below the price that you would have paid for that new vehicle. 
We're talking in some cases several thousands of dollars. That is depreciation. That is money that the vehicle will not present anymore, which may represent to you a lower sale price and therefore a savings to you, both from a cost standpoint and also monthly payments. It's very important that you understand that the value of the vehicle will be lower and the interest rate costs might be a little bit higher too. But there are significant advantages by reducing the cost of the vehicle and the sale price. Also, don't necessarily know what the history of that vehicle is. On a new car, know exactly what you've done, where you've gone, and how well you've taken care of the vehicle. The car vehicle, with all the experience you've got, means something quite significant to you. For who's driven the vehicle you're about to buy, you don't have that same confidence. There's a lot of research out there available for you, car facts and other available history reports that can tell you some of what you're looking for. Those are very, very important tools to use. But again, you never quite know, did they drive the car the way you would or will? That is something to consider. Many vehicles, the older they go, may not have any standard warranty left with them. That is, that came with the new car. There are some other warranties, very short-term warranties that come with a vehicle that are basically associated with the inspection depending upon the jurisdiction. Inspection is there and may be only for 30 days and only the covered components on the inspection. So remember, warranties, while they're on the new car, don't necessarily apply to the used, except when you get an additional warranty. They are available and they come in two forms. There are manufacturer's warranties and then there are aftermarket. Both advantages, both have disadvantages. We always explain those more when you call in or if you have any information uh, that you would like, you can also reach out to us and we can provide that. Remember, the reach is out there for that too, for you to get that. Main costs are also part of that used car. Remember, that car may need significant work that is normal maintenance on a vehicle that has a change, timing change, back changes, maybe some transmission work needs to be done. These are things that are built into the history or the expected life of the vehicle, but may have not been done prior to purchasing the vehicle. Before you buy, get someone to look at the car. When you're doing that, find whether or not there's been that nor expected, more significant maintenance that needs to be done. Again, you're at the dealer. How do you compare the vehicles? There's basic ways. There's the MSRP or Manufacturer Suggested Retail Price sticker. It's called the Monroney. It'll tell you details about that vehicle. It has to by law. It'll tell color, the vehicle ID number, the engine, the transmission, features and options, what is standard and what comes as the option on the vehicle. It provides you the base price of the vehicle, the cost of the options, and any significant savings you might get because you bought them as an option package. Then in the lower right-hand corner, see what that comparative price that you can look at from a sticker to see how good you did on your deal. It'll also have emissions information on there, that it's bad emission and suggests you gas mileage. Used car, you usually don't have the benefit of all that information. However, they do have to disclose some sort of warranty obligation to you. And by that I mean that this vehicle does or does not have any additional warranty. It will tell you the miles on the car, which is critical for any purchase or valuation. It will tell you what the responsibilities are for the dealer if something goes wrong or if it won't. Most of you will see a designation on that vehicle that will be listed as something like as it is. That means once you've purchased the vehicle, you want to assume all the responsibility for the ownership of the vehicle, that is not there are repairs to make or not. Dealers, good dealers will disclose what they know, but sometimes things do slip through the crack. If it's a car, take a longer test drive. Remember, no pun intended, you're in the driver's seat. You have to know that you're satisfied in this process. When you listen to the car, if you have questions about the sounds you hear or the experience you get, how does it feel in the seat, the drive steering wheel, the tires, the vibrations for the vehicle, or even how the vehicle looks from the inside out. For all real questions or value questions, 
And those are legitimate questions to pose to the person that you're talking to that's trying to sell the car. Be afraid to ask the questions. Asking them later is too late. One part I want to mention here is don't sign until you're sure. We've all heard about where somebody goes back and takes that car back because they changed their mind. Be able to do that with a TV. You may be able to do that with that really nice set of towels that just doesn't quite fit with your bathroom. You can't do that with a car. Once you've been purchased and you've the documents, you've paid your money, and you've driven the car away with tags, you bought a car. Some dealers, based on their business models, will allow you the ability to take that car back within a certain period of time. Taking that car back, you may agree to exchange it for another car or get most of your money. In many cases, you can get all your money. But at the time, remember, it is not a right. It is a privilege that is extended by the dealer and make sure you know everything you're supposed to get, everything you're responsible before sign the bottom line. Congratulations. What do you have? Well, it may tell you, but you need to be able to know how to drive the car. More importantly, you paid for a lot of features and options that you may not even be aware of. We have safety features out there like lane designation warnings, or automatic cruise control, or takeover capabilities that are on the vehicle. If you know what they're expected to do in an emergency, you may not be prepared or handling it the right way. Talk to the dealer. They're trying to tell you what to expect and maybe show you some of the things that will happen in those circumstances. It's as simple as how do you get your phone to sync up with your vehicle radio. It's always as easy as it seems. If you've done it once or twice, it becomes second nature. But until it happens, you really do need to have someone show you. There are hundreds of other features, technology-wise, that are available to you that do instruction, that navigation that works on one vehicle may not be the exact navigation on another. And the same thing would hold true with the sound systems and actually some of the computer opportunities or, or resources that are available in the cars. By navigations, remember, not only are you buying a car, but you're buying a payment. Please make sure that you are financing something that is done. And it says, this is probably going to go through OK. Stop doing it. Suffers when he knows or she knows that this is a done deal. By that I mean that the financing has been agreed to by the lender. If it's out that they don't get you approved at that really nice rate, you have the ability to be able to call you in with some of the documentation you're going to sign. That is, if you don't have the financing bought or purchased by the lender, you come in and either return the vehicle for the price that's been negotiated or to secure additional financing that may be available to the dealer. Trust me, if you're in at 1.9 and it's not approved there, chances are they're not going to get you the same or lower rate later. That's why it's always better to go to the financial institution you're comfortable and familiar with and get that approval ahead of time. You buy a car, you buy a payment. It doesn't go away until the balance is done. Just note about car value depreciation. When you buy a car, particularly a car that suits all your needs and takes care of all the issues you need addressed. Keep in mind that value depreciation, that is what a car loses, is an important factor, but it may not be the most key factor. In a car's resale history, that will be whether or not somebody also values or desires that vehicle. That's a good indicator you're on the right track. There are a lot of car companies that have worked very hard to retain or get a very good reputation. And well, that reputation isn't where the way they want, but the quality of the car is. So while it may not have a good value holding right now, it doesn't mean that it won't. Key component, but don't get lost there. It's just one fact when you call the car. So what do you Do you search? It may be simple, it may be common sense, but there are folks out there that go into the deal knowing not as much as they should. They go in not well armed. It's a battle, but it can sure seem like a struggle, and that struggle may turn into a battle if you're not prepared. There's all kinds of information that you can get easily. All you do is look for it. Try to eat it. 
as a car buying service that will help talk you through and walk you through much of this process, and it takes a lot of negotiation out of this process. That trusted partner is something we've worked very hard to be able to provide. Lots of resources like this out there. Um, impulse buying. The more pressure you have, the less impulse there is. Doesn't mean we have a desire for that perfect car. We have the right tools to combat something that may put us way over our head. Put that budget beforehand and be thorough. The more thorough you are, the fewer makes you'll make and the better you'll feel when you've made your decision. Consider financing options before you go into the dealer. Whether a balloon program, which I mentioned before, uh, gives you the ability to buy or use part of the car. The car's still in your name and it has many lease-like benefits. But if you reduce that monthly payment, perhaps get the features and options you couldn't get ordinarily, and in some cases will actually reduce the money out of pocket at the time of delivery that you'd have to come up with. We us call that down payment. But again, that's your money and your decision. The car is not that hard, but it does require confidence. Confidence comes with inflation, and it comes with preparation. Be on top of your plan and the commitment you've made. Lay the groundwork for the next deal by doing this one the right way and making sure you're secure in everything you do. Danielle? Okay. Well, so much, Paul. I invite our attendees to toggle back to the original viewing screen. Um, you can do so by just clicking on the full screen button again. Um, if you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A pod, you will find that at the bottom of the screen um, labeled Q&A. We'll now go through the questions and hopefully we'll have enough time to get through all of the questions, but if we do run out of time, we'll definitely respond via email, so please go ahead and email us your additional questions. Um, and it looks like we do have a few questions from our attendees here, and I will begin. Let's see. First question is, how do I decide what type of financing option is best for me? Thanks, Dale. And whoever asked that question, I'm glad you were listening. Uh, defining those options and figuring out what's out there is actually what you should be doing first and foremost. Um, I contact your trusted financial institution. Ask them questions. There are a lot of options out there. There are historical options that may not have been the first choice for a lot of folks because we've heard some very bad stories. However, it's usually because things weren't used the proper way. Talked about balloon financing before. It's a terrific option for those people that don't hold, hold on to their vehicles for a long period of time. If after two or three years you buy a new car or change vehicles, the balloon option might be a perfect way to go. You're going to have a payment in that scenario unless you pay cash for the vehicle. And this will provide you the lowest payments you can get based on those circumstances and the ease in the facility to get into one car versus another. For the for traditional financing, it really does get down to credit and knowing how much you can purchase. You apply for a lot of money that might affect the lender if they think it's past your capacity. By doing research, asking a lot of questions, and then applying the right way, you're going to be able to see your options unfold in front of you in a wonderful way. Again, a matter of doing what you know and putting a plan into work. Thank you. Uh, the next question here is, uh, does car shopping affect my credit score? Think no. I can't tell you how many dealerships I've gone to you knowing what I'm doing and looking at cars all the time. If I had to worry about credit, I'd be in serious trouble. Where the credit comes into play is when you apply for the money to pay for the loan. You apply at several dealers. Each time credit inquiry is pulled on you, it will affect your credit by a certain amount of points. So when you apply for a loan, it will affect your credit in a negative way. How, with most people's good credit, applying maybe once, perhaps twice for that car is not going to hurt you at all. Remember, making good payment histories, uh, paying what's required and making sure you haven't gone over your head is all going to work to your benefit overall. If you've been in the past, you've laid the groundwork for a good credit now, and it doesn't seem to me that you're going to have any problems going forward. Great. And let's see. A funny one. 
Okay, so I came into the dealership wanting a Honda, but the dealer is trying to get me into a Porsche or Porsche. How do I avoid this from happening? <laughs> do you really want to avoid buying that car? <laughs> that is a very good question because it does happen all the time. Let's take Porsche out of this for a moment because Porsche are great cars and everyone can see the appeal. Well, have a car educated to the dealer you really want. And they push you in another direction in another car when clearly they have a car very close to what you would want and desire. Chances are there's more in it for them. If you know what you're looking for and you've done your research, which we've talked about quite a bit this afternoon, you serve yourself well by just staying to the course that you've planned to do. If it provides you an option, it doesn't hurt to listen for 15 seconds. Continuing not to answer your questions, or take you in the direction you want to go. As I mentioned before, I told you the best thing to do is to walk away. Find another dealer that will listen to you and provide you the information you're looking for for the car that will make you happy. Um, I'm trying to figure out a good reason why we don't buy the Porsche. <laughs> so here's another one. Um, <clears throat> this is actually a very common question. Um, if I don't have a lot of money for a down payment, should I just forget about getting a car? Most of our need to buy the car is usually before we've saved up money. And whether we have a down payment, we see a car. I would see you, however, can buy a car without a payment. It's better to buy a car with a down payment because you're in a better position from a leverage point of view. How much you're loaning against the vehicle will be more in your favor. However, those circumstances do come up where the amount of money you've got may not be quite as much as maybe the lender initially was providing for you. If you get a $20,000 car and you've got $2,000 that you're going to put down and you want to borrow $18,000 after everything else is said, the value of that vehicle exceeds the amount you're borrowing. That same vehicle is worth $18,000 and you don't have any money to put down and after tax and tags and maybe a warranty that you might purchase, number of the vehicle goes up to twenty thousand, or the cost is, it doesn't support the value of eighteen. Doesn't mean they won't give you the money, but it would mean that they may assess a little bit more of a cost to you in terms of risk. So special financing or the one point nine or two point nine that would be there as an example might in fact be Point four nine or two point nine nine as a result. Debts are good; they're not essential. But if you have good credit, you're in a position. Great. Uh, let's see. It looks like I have time for one more question. Um, here's one. I found a I found a listing for a car on Craigslist, which is happens a lot. Um, can I just pay cash and drive away with the car? You would. But I'm not that's the best thing to do. Credit and so many other buyer services that are out there right now, and there's more than we can possibly mention, are a great resource to find where vehicles are. It's easy for the seller and often very easy for the buyer. But it does come without risk. What site you're going to do, you do not know necessarily who that seller is. That site represents a very legitimate vehicle in good condition with all the papers and the history that you would want to know to make a wise decision. In the end, it may not be the person you think you are, they think that you think you are. It may be that there is no car. You just have to be careful. So whether or not you buy that car with the cash and walk away, it's still to make sure you've got a test drive and there's lots you can do to protect yourself that we can talk about at another time. But it's very important that you do your test drive. They you do your test drive, then you probably want to take it, if you're very serious about it, to somebody that you trust to get evaluated. Or just like you go into a dealer and they provide you that as-is sticker, you're in an as-is situation here, too. You know what warranties may or may not be available or what the experience is on the vehicle. A car history report is probably the first thing you'd want to do. But take to that trusted advisor, the mechanic that's done you right for such a long time, it's absolutely the best step to take. Once those other issues have been addressed, and both you can agree on a price that is acceptable to both, 
then and only then do you want to take that cash to pay for it. Aside, I often recommend you conclude a lot of these transactions at a financial institution. You don't want to walk around with a lot of cash. If you've got cash, meet the bank, meet it at a credit unit. There's safety there and there's protection for both the buyer and the seller. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Paul, for providing so many valuable tips and strategies that I think that all of us can say that we feel a lot better going into the dealership now and, and purchasing a vehicle. Thank you. Thank you. I just provided some additional resources here. Um, so if you have any additional questions about the process or the car buying process, um, please feel free to visit our website um, to get some additional information. Um, you can also speak with one of our uh, congressional federal representatives as well. I've provided the phone number there. Um, that wraps up our presentation on how to become a confident car buyer. Again, a uh, archived link of the presentation will be sent to you in the next couple of days. And if you do have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, you can do it through email or via phone, and we will gladly answer the questions that you have. Thank you again for your time and attention. Thank you.